Railway guards have always been an important part of railway life. Their role reassures the driver that the train is safe and ready to depart, especially if the train relied on standard doors that anyone can open and close. It was always handy to have an extra pair of hands on the train to help with passengers and to help should anything go wrong. However, trains on the underground were becoming more and more advanced. Turnstiles would replace conductors and catch fare dodgers. The doors could close automatically and could be locked before departure, and a driver could keep an eye on his passengers at all times. London Transport had been touting the idea of a one-man train for years. It would save a lot of money, and staff would be reduced to a bare minimum. But the unions were less than pleased. At first, the unions simply couldn't allow trains to be run single-handed. But in 1968, new rolling stock was specifically designed to be operated by just one person. In the early 80s, advances in CCTV and new map platform monitoring measures quelled the last of the union's arguments and the one-person train was born. Despite the obvious savings from the staff redundancies, the railway was still hemorrhaging money. The Conservative government, which were still in charge of County Hall, tried to fill the black hole by increasing fares all across the transport network. A 20% rise in March 1980, followed by a 13% rise six months later, did not sit well with passengers, and passenger numbers declined rapidly. The cost of growing fares soon saw the network at the epicentre of a huge political row and was one of the key issues during the 1983 general election. And although the Conservatives won by a landslide, it was Labour that controlled the Greater London Council. In its manifesto, it promised lower fares and introduced the Fares Fare Scheme. They split the underground and the bus network into zones and charged the fare dependent on that zone rather than the length of the journey. On average, this saved the consumer 32% annually and passenger numbers increased by half a million in its first day alone. It had a secondary effect too. With passengers leaving their cars at home for public transport, air quality in London rose and traffic congestion was cut. The fares fare scheme, however, did not do enough to, to fill the black hole of debt and the additional benefits were being funded by the common taxpayer. The London Borough of Bromley, angered by the sudden increase in the taxpayer's pocket, questioned whether the increased rate was legal, especially when their constituents hadn't had underground services yet. Ultimately, the courts agreed and the fares fare scheme was forced to be wound up just one year after inception. The government said that in order for the underground to even break even, the underground had to increase fares by a staggering 100%. Amazingly, the underground did it, and once again, passenger numbers slumped to an all-time low. The government, shamefaced, realised a compromise had to be found and allowed the underground to cut prices by 25%. One of the new initiatives brought on by the new zonal fares was the introduction of the travel card. Passengers could purchase one card which would allow them unlimited travel in either one zone or between set zones for a set amount of time. And with the card being universally accepted on both the buses and the train, it was a hit with passengers. It took a few years, but passenger numbers were finally on a steady rise. In 1984, the Conservative government removed London Transport from under the General London Council and created a new corporation called London Regional Transport. At the head was the Secretary State of Transport. Its goal was to improve services while removing the taxpayer's burden to pay for it. The one-man trains helped achieve this as well as the removal of costly maintenance processes at certain depots instead moving the maintenance to larger facilities that could do the work quickly and cheaply. In 1985, the London Underground Limited Company was unveiled to the world under the umbrella of the LRT. 
It had the opportunity to be its own company in its own right, but still received public funding if it needed it. The 1980s also brought a change to the rolling stock too. 15 new trains were introduced to the Jubilee line. They were smaller than the older D stock, but had many of the features. It was produced in Acton House with no outside input and the design research unit who had helped design earlier stock was no longer utilised. Considered the pacer of the underground, the mustard drab interior, the flat squared off cabs and the lack of colour were easily some of the worst decor that the railway had produced. The only plus that the that stock had was the lighting. New lighting ceiling rigs would travel down the train, bathing the interior in a strong, even light. The lights, however, were covered in housing that quickly became full of dust. Just 15 years after being unveiled, the 1983 stock were earmarked for the scrapyard. The 1962 stock on the central line was also beginning to see its end. So it was decided to place both the stock and the signalling to match the Victoria Line's ATO design. Following the disastrous reception of the 1983 stock, Acton Works consulted several designers to help design the new ones, and thanks to the inspiration from British Rail with the APT, three new designs were put forward and three prototype trains were created. The trains were used specifically for research, and the best features from each prototype would go into the new 1992 stock. While the 60s and 70s focused on the stock, it left little revenue to revamp the stations. Newer stations on the Victoria line made the older stations, especially those on the Metropolitan lines, look more decrepit. It was decided that a total overhaul would be needed to bring these stations up to scratch. The Baker Street station had remained practically untouched and was just covered in panelling in an attempt to make the station look somewhat good. When the teams removed the panels, they were astounded to find the original brickwork from 1863 underneath. Thanks to the coverings, the brickwork was well protected and the muck was removed from the platforms. Clever lighting and new tile work give the illusion of light streaming through the station, just like it was in the 1870s, and everything was carefully preserved to bring the station back to its railway glory without it looking run down. All the work was completed in time for the station's 120th anniversary. Other stations, such as Tottenham Court Road, received new mosaics reflecting its music heritage. Piccadilly Circus received modern lighting and featured the colours red, blue and brown. Paddington benefited from a new ticketing hall and new tiling depicting Brunel's original tunnelling machine and Bond Street got new rebranding with bright red lettering. All of the work, however, was not all harmonious. The Internal Architectural Services Group and the Department of Signals and Electrical Engineering, who were responsible for the signage around the stations, were not too happy with each other. The architects wanted designs to be modern but styled to the particular station, but the Department of Signals wanted something in keeping with historical references. More and more stations were involved in the fray, and it was quickly established that, other than the roundels, there was no set president and no universal guidelines when it came to signage. This clearly had to change for the modern universal railway network that the underground wanted to portray. Henry and Ludlow and Schmidt were contracted to sort out the mess. They specialised in corporate identity and ran an extensive report into the current status of all the underground signage. They looked at everything from colour to font and made several key recommendations. The signage must be functional. A planning and positioning guide must be developed and used at every station. And the positioning of the new signage must be consistent with every station. In short, if one station puts a sign up in one place, then they must all do it. The corporate identity company then set out to create new designs and signage and was tested firstly on the Victoria line. 
Being the busiest line on the network and thanks to its tourism links, the line most likely was most likely to have passengers unfamiliar with the network. It would really push the designs to the limit. Satisfied that the designs performed well with little confusion, it was rolled out globally. As you travel along the underground, there are still remnants of the old signage here and there as a reminder to the underground's past. But every sign is now uniform, uses the same lettering, font, background and positioned just where you would expect them to be. Another addition to the station were the various help points. The 1980s saw a big spike in crime related incidents, especially on the network. With the most basic of mobile phones expensive and bulky, and the payphone being metres away above passenger heads, if passengers were in trouble or needed information, they would be royally stuck. The help points allowed passengers to seek help at a simple touch of a button. They could call in emergencies, ask for extra assistance if they're unable to use the facilities around them, or just simply get information about the station and the next train. These help points were great particularly for unmanned stations. From 1987 onwards, the stations went through another major overhaul, this time for their staff safety. The ticket halls would handle thousands of pounds in cash each day, and as car payments were a lot rarer in the 1980s, robbing the ticket halls was deemed easy picking with good profit. Some passengers would also ride on expired tickets and try to forge their travel cards to make them last longer. The underground had had enough, and when a member of staff lost their lives to a thief, they knew they had to act. Ticket halls were rebuilt to include wall-mounted ticketing machines, and ticket sellers were protected by bulletproof glass safely tucked away in the walls. This move in particular caused some uproar, with heritage groups citing that they were destroying the architectural history of the halls. But it was, in the underground eyes, a necessary evil. To go with the new machines came new gates. The stainless steel automatic gates were very simple and would only open if your fare was correct for your journey. For example, if you bought a Zone 1 ticket and entered a gate at a Zone 1 station, then the gate would open when you presented your ticket to the machine. However, if you were to travel to a Zone 2 area, then your ticket wouldn't work and it wouldn't let you out the station. Your only option was to buy a Zone 2 ticket or go back to a Zone 1 area. It was simple, but very effective. So we've reached 1987, where I'm going to leave this for now. Next time we go to King's Cross, where the underground would face its greatest fear, and how a simple discarded match would change the company's policy on health and safety, even today. <laughs>